Everybody knows that Jewish mysticism was very important in the development of Gnosticism, but what does Jewish mysticism and Gnosticism have in common today? Uh, easy for me to say. We'll find out with our guest tonight as we talk about Jewish Gnosticism. Coming right up on Talk Gnosis. Hi everybody, I'm Father Tony, and joining me this uh, balmy evening is uh, Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. How is it up there in Montreal? Well, it's, it's very warm, and I can't open the window to my office because there's quite a lot of uh, noise for the street. So um, We make uh, such sacrifices for the show, don't we? I, I do. I apologize to the audience in advance as they, as they watch me disgustingly sweat through this wonderful <laughs> show. Uh, which is which is going to be a wonderful show because, of course, we do have a, an awesome guest tonight. So yes, yeah, so let's introduce our awesome guest. We have Rabbi Andrea Cohen, Andrea Cohen Kiner, to join us uh, to talk about Jewish uh, enosis. Welcome, Rabbi. Hi, gentlemen. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us on the show. We look forward to talking to you. My pleasure. So uh, let's jump right into it. After uh, you know, as we watch Jonathan sweat throughout the evening. Um, what is your understanding of Gnosticism and how does it relate to Judaism? Well, I'm delighted to be here. Um, discussing Gnosis is really one of my favorite topics and I hope to sort of check out some of my concepts with you this evening and see how my thoughts um, are relevant to current expressions of Gnosticism. But in general, my sense of Gnosticism, to put it very simply, is that um, it refers to our capacity for inner guidance, our capacity for perception, and we can articulate this a little bit more, but the practical aspect of me is somehow we seem to have the capacity to sense truth, guidance, something more subtle, and in the language of Jewish mysticism, I would talk about the idea of our spirit being accessible to us through our lower vessel of thought, affect, and physicality being in alignment, being centered, being oriented in a sincere way. And when we create a vessel of ourselves in alignment, we are able to perceive something higher. That's my simply put <laughs> op opening, you know, response to your question. No, that's great. Um, now, Gnosticism is kind of famous for being somewhat dualistic. Uh, do you see anything like that in Jewish mysticism? A matter-spirit dualism kind of thing? Yeah, well, the dualism and the unity is all very mysterious, isn't it? <laughs> yes. And, um, I mean, I should say right off that it's a little bit ironic to have a, a show about Gnosticism because, in essence, I would say Gnosticism, one way to know that you're talking about Gnosticism is you can't put it into words. <laughs> And yeah. here we'll have a conversation about uh, something that is meant to be sensed and not really um, spoken of. Um, but uh, coming to your point about the dualism, I mean, we do say the first letter of the Torah, our um, revealed scripture, is a bet, the world of two. Um, the story of creation that we tell talks about a sense of separating between day and night, creator and creation, male and female, up and down. Um, seas and land. The world that we live in is a world of apparent separation and apparent duality. And uh, my sense in the, you know, as I would portray the Jewish tradition, the Jewish sense of the human being and the human capacity is that we have the capacity and the obligation to be the connector that unifies, that recognizes unity in this world of separation and duality. Mm -hmm. So Rabbi, do you see Gnosticism as uh, a living stream, a living tradition, something that's important to Jewish spiritual life today? Because for many people, Gnosticism is just something that's, you know, from a long time ago, that's maybe interesting to read and think about. Do, do you see it in that way, or do you see it as sort of relevant to, to Jewish spiritual life today? Well, I have hit upon Gnosticism um, as a way for me to talk in a living way about what I think is the essence of Jewish mysticism and, in fact, the Jewish religious tradition. Because if people are aware of it or not, if they're practicing it or not, it's my sense that Gnosticism 
is the living religious impulse within our tradition. The cosmology of Judaism, which is Gnostic, um, is the cosmology of Judaism. It's not separate. And so for me to be able to give an indication to people about what I think is this inner vein in Judaism, I use the word Gnostic to describe that. Um, it gives me a chance to talk using uh, a word that people don't have a lot of associations with and where I can start to build up um, a sense of what that might be about to uh, activate our inner um, receptor, our inner perceiver. So um, I think a lot of people are just not really aware of the Gnostic impulse and trend within Judaism, even though it does constitute both the framework and the cosmology and the theology of the Jewish tradition. Uh, so for me, the word itself is just an opening to invite people into conversation about something that is real, perceived, universal, and deeply inherent in Judaism, whether people are aware of it or not. I mean, to be honest, in the, in the Jewish religion today, um, people identify through a sense of peoplehood, through a sense of a shared practice, a shared calendar, um, in some cases a nationalism expressed around identity with Israel, um, certainly a legal tradition. So there's many faces and aspects of the Jewish tradition, but I do believe Gnosticism is our theology and our path, the inner path of Judaism. When you talk about this uh, uh, to Jewish audiences, what is their reaction? How do they feel about it? You know, um, I've had some experiences lately of, uh, of making my case that there is a um, inner path embedded in the Bible, in the Talmud, in Hasidism, in various um, strata of Jewish literature and philosophy. And first of all, on a factual level, it strikes people as something new and surprising. And then I find that um, as we start to talk about ideas that would bring us into that area of you got to find it for yourself. You've got to find out what part of this is true for you and so on. I feel like people kind of go into beginner mind and they start to compare the ideas that I'm speaking about to stuff that they themselves really already know and intuit. Mm. But any teacher that invites people to look inward and find um, their own passion, their own sense of things, their own inner guidance, it's... People go into beginner mind, and then they begin to seek, and they begin to find. Right. So, so Rabbi, j just to clarify, um, uh, we used to joke. Uh, I used to take uh, religious studies way back when I went to college. We used to joke that all the Buddhists we knew were Jews, <laughs> right? And uh, a lot of people in in the Abrahamic religions, you know, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, when they go looking for these meditative inner and mystical practices, they, they turn to the East, right? If they want to learn meditation, they, they study with Buddhists or Hindus. Is is it, do we have to look to the East for these, or is it there in Judaism already? Is there this mystical and meditative practices? That's a, that's a terrific question. Um, we have a word for those Jewish Buddhists, we call them Jubus. <laughs> And uh, when they come when they come into my synagogue, I give them transfer credit for all the <laughs> inner work they did in Buddhism. <laughs> they often don't know Hebrew very well, but they know um, path, mm. you know, very very well. Um, well, let me say this. I'll say a few things about that. Um, the Jewish mystical tradition uh, had been actively uh, tended and expressed and transmitted. We say uh, from Adam down through Moses, through the prophets, that's uh, the biblical transmission of it, through the teachings and teachers of Judaism right down to, um, let's say, Europe, uh, the huge population of Jewish people in Central and Eastern Europe. And in truth, something like 90% of our spiritual teachers were killed in a 10-year period during World War II. Mm -hmm. And so the um, proponents of Judaism that made it to the new land were not, the new land meaning America, were not so much the seekers. They were the, um, let's say, economic migrants with a sense of a Jewish peoplehood identity 
but um, not necessarily the seekers and the mystics. And in an oral tradition, in a tradition that's transmitted, as we say, from mouth to ear, um, mm-hmm. that loss was, was pretty devastating. And so when um, Jews established themselves in the middle part of the last century, in the second part of the last century, um, and became comfortable in their practice, in their acceptance in the um, American milieu, those that were seeking weren't able to find answers easily in the Jewish tradition. And um, so a lot of us did go to the West, including some of our teachers, <laughs> excuse me, to the East, and including some of our teachers went to the East. But those of them that knew and had participated in the transmission of mystical Judaism um, before, during, or after their search in the East were able to help a whole generation and now a second generation to integrate those teachings of the Jewish practice with, as my teacher uh, Rabbi Zalman Schachter of uh, Blessed Memory, as, as he said, we were able to pick up from the Buddhists those essential amino acids that we had lost during World War II. Mm. Yeah, we, we often say something similar, or I, I shouldn't say we, <laughs> I often say something similar in, uh, in, in about uh, our tradition and my tradition, you know, sometimes that uh, we got a we got to borrow and get a little bit of that, I guess, to continue the metaphor, a little bit of that uh, DNA back into the mix because, uh, you know, it's been lost for different reasons or, or hidden in, in the more mainstream uh, 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 Christian understanding and Christian practice. So sometimes we get a, you know, a little bit of an injection or a little bit of a start or a little bit of new DNA or blood from the, the East to jumpstart our own uh, uh, meditative and uh, spiritual practices. Um, do 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 do. Uh, oh wait, I should save that for the <laughs> for the podcast. How are we doing for time, Father? We got a minute or two. Okay. So, uh, Rabbi, do you see the you know Gnosticism, Jewish Gnosticism, Jewish mysticism as a particularly good meeting place for for cross religion and cross cultural dialogue? Is, is this a good place for, you know, for Christian mystics and Christian Gnostics or Islamic Gnostics or the already mentioned Buddhists to sort of come together and, and talk and exchange? Is, is there a deeper connection or, or more understandable connection between these different faiths when we get into the Gnostic and mystical stuff? Briefly, yes. <laughs> a little bit less briefly I will say uh, I'll try to make this quick for purposes of time but I think that each of our paths um, is a path at the foot of the mountain and each of our traditions has a base camp at the foot of the mountain and that would be our more pragmatic and literal interpretation of our various written and practiced traditions and as we climb the mountain you know we get kind of proud of ourselves, we're climbing, we're getting higher, we're using the tools of our tradition. I use Torah and rabbinic literature and the Jewish calendar to uh, practice my search. But as I get above the tree line, as I climb higher and higher and get above the tree line and look around, I can say, oh, here come the Christians. Oh, here's Muslims. There's humanists up here. Who would have thought, you know? And we get to the point where you know, far from being completely identified with our own base camp and root tradition, we can really see that as seekers, we have very much in common with each other. And all of us are aiming towards that point at the top of the mountain, where it isn't it where it's God, where it's truly, truly one. Mm-hmm. Um, and to sort of uh, build on that, that, that question, so must one be a, a Jew to practice and study and gain benefit from sort of Jewish mysticism and, and what you see as sort of the, the Jewish inner gnosis and Gnosticism? I wouldn't think so at all. I would think the um, reality map of Kabbalah and um, some of the practices would be very universal. In general, I find the Gnostic um, value in Judaism to be some of our most universal and easily shared uh, components. Um, I think certainly having a practice and a peoplehood and a literature, if you are a Jewish seeker and you have all of these components of a practice and a community and a theology and a spiritual path, if you're working them all together, I think your search is, is a little better supported than if you're, you know, pulling in ideas from this tradition and practices from that. I'm I don't view that negatively, but I but I would say the opposite that 
if there's a lot of coherence in uh, your search, you might find that you have more support. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, uh, let's wrap things up here, actually, so we can uh, go into some more detail in the podcast version. Go to GnosticWisdom.net slash TGAD, Talk Gnosis After Dark, uh, for uh, information about how to subscribe to the podcast, if you haven't already. Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, in wrapping things up, uh, Rabbi Cohen Kiner, thank you so much for once again joining us on the show. And is there some place you'd like to point people if they want to find out more about you, a website or anything? Well, I'm the uh, spiritual leader at uh, Temple Israel in Greenfield, and um, the uh, rabbi's blog sometimes does uh, bring in Gnostic concepts, and that might be a good place for people to um, hear some of the ways I'm applying these ideas at this time. All right, fantastic. We'll, uh, we'll make sure to put a link to that in the show notes so everybody can check that out. All right, so then uh, for everybody who is watching along at home, we will see you next week. Good night. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.